proud to be on that list of winners now on BBC One. Welcome to Have I Got News For You, I'm Frankie Boyle. In the news this week, at an earth-shattering press conference, the Queen and Prince Philip revealed that David Icke was right all along. <laughs> After Beyonce gets a flat tyre, the bloke at the garage tries a little too hard to impress her. And at the BBC, news reaches the dressing room that Piers Morgan has pulled out of question time. <laughs> <laughs> On Ian's team tonight is a trenchant journalist and author who's been compared to Katie Hopkins, although unlike Katie Hopkins, she still has a reflection. Please welcome <laughs> Talk Radio's Julia Hartley Brewer. And with Paul tonight is the writer and star of BBC sitcom Citizen Can. He's never shared the stage with extremists. Until tonight, please <laughs> welcome Adel Ray. <laughs> and we start with the bigger stories of the week. Paul and Adel, mm. take a look at this. Oh, yes, this ah. is the new Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, um, and there's Jeremy Corbyn probably on his ways of votes, and uh, do it again, would you? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's the not going around in circles, and uh, that's the sort of thing you need to do when you want to get your picture in the paper. Um, <laughs> so, yes, uh, lots of people getting out and voting. Yeah, yeah. this is <laughs> yeah. The, the various elections we've had. This is the election of Sadiq Khan as London mm. Mayor, and uh, the massive resurgence of the Tories in Scotland that put them into quite a poor second. Uh, <laughs> did you f follow the London Mayor debate? I did, various... yes. Followed it with uh, great delight, but um, on behalf of all Muslims, and that's what I do, you know, as a Muslim we talk on behalf of all of us. Um, <laughs> um, and there is, there is 1.6 billion of us, uh, and I have spoken to them all before we came on tonight. So <laughs> we're, not, we're not very happy uh, because he's not a proper Muslim. Yeah. <laughs> no, no beard. In fact, you'd be, you'd be a better Muslim than uh, Sadiq Khan. I think. Yeah. My man. And if you're you know. wondering where my beard is, they wouldn't let me through security with it. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, so yes. Sadiq Khan, though, is we just don't know enough about him. We don't know anything about his background. I mean, like, what did his father do for a living? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Exactly. There, there was quite a sad moment where Paul Golding, who's the head of Britain first, he turned his back on Sadiq Khan during his acceptance speech. I thought it'd be good if he'd accidentally turned to face Mecca. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's quite possible what was happening, yeah. He went on the first day straight to a Holocaust memorial service, didn't he? Yes, that was, uh, that was a convenient, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah and, and good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He also spent the entire first day not meeting Jeremy Corbyn, and the second day, and the third day, and there wasn't actually a meeting at all well, Monday Well, evening. he doesn't want to share a platform with extremists anymore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I interviewed Sadiq Khan, actually, on my talk radio show. I thought I'd get that in. And, um, talk, talk radio, talk radio show. show yes. But I interviewed all the candidates, and I said to him, so would a victory for Sadiq Khan in, in, for the London Mayor, would that be a victory for Jeremy Corbyn's leadership of the Labour Party? And Sadiq Khan said, is that the time? <laughs> what was it? Prayer time, was it? Was like... <laughs> get used to that. Get used to that. <laughs> Sadiq Khan can walk out of any interview, any time. I've got to go. Sorry, it's prayer time. So, good on you, Sadiq. The Conservative candidate, Zach Goldsmith, uh, was thought by many to have run a divisive campaign, but what happened to Linton Crosby, the man who ran his campaign this week? He got knighted. He was knighted. Yes. Perhaps to put his Islamophobic campaign into the context of the Crusades. <laughs> well, I must say at this point that Sadiq did have to apologise um, during the campaign for calling moderate Muslims Uncle Toms. 
a couple yes. of years ago. I just, you know, this is balance, and I don't want Whippingdale, Whittingdale, <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> making a fuss about. I just, I just throw that in. It is, you know, there is, is. I have to. I have there to are see. things to say on on both sides. What camping metaphor did Sadiq Khan use to describe Labour's future? We have to uh, appeal to people outside of our own tents. Yeah, that's, that's almost exactly it. He mm. said, Labour has to be a big tent that appeals to everyone. To which Jeremy Corbyn quickly responded, We have a very big tent. <laughs> it's an enormous tent. It's just that everybody else is outside pissing into it. <laughs> Saying they want us all to go camping with them. <laughs> because I ain't sharing a tent with Diane Abbott. I don't know about you, Paul. <laughs> Hasn't bothered me in the past. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell what's going on here? Is mm. it the man on the right as we look is incredibly strong and he's lifting up all the arms? <laughs> Are these Scottish Tories? I can see some ginger hair. No offence. Is that the first time anyone said no offence to Frankie Boyle? <laughs> <laughs> None taken. <laughs> <laughs> These are some new members of the Scottish Parliament. This is Edward Mountain, MSP for Highlands and Islands. What special skill does he have that involves a cow? <laughs> You know this one. He is—he is, he is qualified to use on, to artificially inseminate cows. How do you know that? <laughs> <laughs> Correct answer. Next up, we've got Lib Dem MSP Willie Rennie. Uh, he's been a runner-up in the Scottish Championships for carrying what? A grudge. <laughs> <laughs> That's a hotly contested field. <laughs> He was runner-up in the 2006 Scottish Coal Carrying Championships. Ah, one way of keeping warm without burning it. <laughs> in Scotland, there was a strong SNP vote from the Scottish people who hate Britain, a big Tory vote from the Scottish people who hate Scottish people, <laughs> and a small Labour vote from the Scottish people who hate themselves. <laughs> no one can call the BBC bias tonight. <laughs> Jeremy Corbyn didn't do well in Scotland because people in Scotland don't trust anyone who looks old but still has teeth. <laughs> <laughs> Ian and Julia, take a look at this. Oh, well, free pasties for everyone. Oh, sorry, missed that. Cheers, yes, uh, they don't like it up them. <laughs> <laughs> and we're all going to die in World War Three. So that's brilliant. Nice cheery news from the uh, EU referendum campaign. This stage of the campaign, you've got to up it. So you've basically got to tell people it's death and bubonic plague. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what'll happen if you leave. The thing I find really strange is how much war has got involved with this, though, because we have Boris Johnson singing um, Ode to Joy in German this week. Uh, uh, we've had Ken Livingstone, who's not like Hitler Tourette's. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we've got Cameron talking about World War Three. I just don't know what's gone wrong in the last week. This is day one, war and genocide. Yeah. Surely it's just going to end with Cameron screaming Ebola through a rolled up newspaper. <laughs> <isn't it? laughs> No, you, you would think that, you know, if he really believed that as soon as we leave the EU there'll be a world war, just don't have the referendum then. But he did say just a few months ago that he was considering <coughs> vote. He didn't know which way he was going to go depending on the reforms he got. And now he's saying catastrophic, yep. death and destruction. Are you suggesting he's exaggerating? I I'm, I'm suggesting that he, he's a liar. I just can't work out if he's doing it now or he did it then. Or both. Or both. <laughs> <laughs> you get every American um, general or spy chief comes in and says, you must remain. No, but it is bizarre because they keep saying it's really important that we stay in this political union with the EU, um, um, and yet bizarrely are not in a political union with Mexico themselves. They're planning to build a wall. So what's that about? It's just Trump who's planning to build a oh, wall, okay. isn't it? I don't think it's official US policy yet. <laughs> <laughs> the bricklayers union have been really strong, <laughs> <isn't> <laughs> Well, a lot of them are Mexicans. Indeed. <laughs> uh, what have ITV done to upset approximately half the Brexit people? Oh, ITV have decided to, to put Nigel Farage up for one of their big debates, and so they've upset Vote Leave, and Vote Leave is now threatening to sue because they said they're the official campaign, and therefore it should be them and not Nigel Farage who gets to choose who goes up. And Vote Leave would rather have... Boris. Anyone, literally anyone. Ken Livingston <laughs> shouting Hitler every three minutes. <laughs> David Christmas. And when we've uh, veered off into the world of uh, TV, what has John Whittingdale hit us up with this week? 
Damn good thrashing. <laughs> <laughs> He's come up with a white paper um, on broadcasting, which is not as extreme as, as was trailed. Mm. As so often with the government, they've said they're going to do one thing, and then people have said, that's a terrible idea, and they've said, oh, really? Oh, all right, we won't do it. Um, <laughs> which is very good news. But isn't there something quite strange in a government that isn't talking to junior doctors, getting wound up about what time Strictly comes on? <laughs> <laughs> well, Whittingdale and Strictly are two words you should... <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, I did notice there was something about... Uh, it did say, we don't mind Strictly, but perhaps, perhaps not Bargain Hunt. I think that was actually mentioned <laughs> in the white paper. <laughs> so this is just some old blokes just choosing what they like, isn't it? Yeah. You know? What about if the BBC's popular programmes had a kind of handicap? system, so they could make a property programme, but it had to be set in the Gaza Strip. <laughs> Homes under the Hamas. <laughs> For reasons that will become clear, although are admittedly extremely tenuous, let's have a look at a block of flats being demolished in Glasgow, as seen through the camera lens of one excited onlooker. This week saw the official launch of the EU referendum campaigns. David Cameron has implied that leaving the EU could lead to World War III, whereas Nigel Farage is hoping for a rerun of World War II. <laughs> this week we saw the one sure sign a referendum is on its way, as Gordon Brown was brought out of retirement to dance on a ball like an old abused circus bear. <laughs> You just can't let it go, can you? <laughs> Bolinado, here's another one for you. Yes. There's the Queen with the Chinese president. Who? Yeah, the president. <laughs> uh, there's Prince Philip doing the barest minimum. <laughs> uh, yeah, so it's about leaks, isn't it, essentially? Or not leaks, but sort of overheard conversations, isn't it? Cameron also talked about corrupt uh, government leaders arriving for a conference and stuff. And yes, that's, that's, that's... this is uh, the Prime Minister and the Queen have been caught on camera, mm. sticking it to the jolly old foreigners. <laughs> uh, do well, you know... I mean, it's an incredible story. I mean, the Prime Minister is caught on camera telling the truth. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Shall we have a little look at what Cameron said? Yeah, absolutely. A very successful cabinet meeting this morning. We were talking about our anti-corruption summit. We've got the Nigerians. The, we've actually got some leaders of some fantastically corrupt countries coming to Britain. No, Nigeria and Afghanistan, possibly the two most corrupt countries. But in the this world. particular he's president really is actually not corrupt. No, he's trying very hard. They are coming at their own expense. I, I mean, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, I mean, the, the Archbishop of Canterbury was trying to point out to the Prime yes. Minister that this particular um, Nigerian Prime Minister is trying to stop corruption. Mm. And the way Cameron was selling it was as trying to tell the Queen, this is going to be great, we've got the top <laughs> corrupt people in the world coming. <laughs> um, to learn from us. Yeah. <laughs> well, what he demanded, um, the Nigerian President, is he said, I don't want an apology, I'd like some of the money back. Because uh, most of the Nigerian money flows into Britain through the British colonies and ends up in houses in London, schools, cars, dealerships. And he's saying, if you could stop our kleptocrats uh, spending all the money in your tax havens, then perhaps that would be a start. And at that point, Cameron remembered mum and dad. <laughs> and, <laughs> and probably went a bit quiet. What grounds did David Cameron have for calling Nigeria and Afghanistan fantastically corrupt? Facts. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're actually oh, quite close to the real answer. <laughs> oh, <really? laughs> There's a transparency index of corrupt countries. I think Afghanistan is third from the bottom. Nigeria's a good way up. We're number ten. Very proud. Well, so, is that the ten most corrupt or the <laughs> yeah. what, what, what top ten are we in? <laughs> you move up the league like Leicester and just suddenly come well, and surprise there, everyone. There, there's, there's a great story where apparently the Pakistani delegation went to the, the anti-corruption conference at the time and, and back then at the end of the conference they would announce who are the most ranked anti-corrupt <laughs> countries in the world and they came to the announcer and the announcer goes well Pakistan started the conference at number seven but having tried to bribe the anti-corruption <laughs> committee <laughs> they find themselves now at number two. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a theory isn't there that they maybe did it deliberately to create a big 
stink around the Euro referendum. I sort of think possibly Cameron is saving the Queen's death for when he needs a really big news story. <laughs> I think he'll go, for his, he'll go for his weekly meeting one week, he'll take a pillow out of his briefcase and say, I'm sorry, ma'am, ISIS have landed in Cornwall. <laughs> how, did, uh, how did the Queen add to things? The Queen was yes. overheard saying the Chinese were a bit... Uh, uh, rude. Tricky. Rude. Was that rude. What she said? Yes, rude. Mm. The royal family have got form when it comes to upsetting the Chinese. Surprisingly, it's not Prince Philip. Can you remember who it was? Uh, Prince Charles described the Chinese communist leadership as a bunch of ghastly old waxworks. <laughs> was this just before the ambassador then left? <laughs> <laughs> just before he complimented him on his chocolates. <laughs> 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 We uh, have a picture of Prince Charles yes. making that remark. <laughs> <laughs> this is the news that David Cameron and the Queen have been filmed making indiscreet comments about foreigners. This all came despite the fact that we're always told the royal family are great for tourism and business. Perhaps if we had a country worth visiting, we wouldn't have to parade the products of centuries of incest around to try to sell fridge magnets. <laughs> has, has this turned into a party political? <laughs> On their last visit, the Chinese threatened to call the trip off. The Queen said they were very rude to the ambassador. But then again, if you're trying to get Chinese people to ask you for a Ferrero Rocher... <laughs> <laughs> That's a Prince Philip joke. <laughs> Ian and Julia, here's another one for you. Oh, exam stress. Yes, old-fashioned schooling. Up. Oh, oh Ferro. Bend over, lad, this won't hurt. <laughs> and I think that's a U-turn. <laughs> uh, this is another government U-turn, um, to add to all the other ones. And this one's over academies. Yes. It was in the middle of the last budget, and I think it was thrown in as yep. to show that they do have some ideas, even if they're very, very bad. It's, it's a new way of governing. <laughs> <laughs> there was also uh, some controversy around the SATs exams. Yeah. What happened to the reading test paper for seven-year-olds? Oh, it was leaked. Someone gave it away. A rogue examiner, apparently, looked at it on a website and then gave it away. I think the rogue examiner is now on the run and is <laughs> the Edward Snowden of telling people <laughs> how to spell necessary. <laughs> In the last 12 months, the government has done more U-turns than Matt LeBlanc screeching around the cenotaph. <laughs> chicken. What was the U-turn about chicken? It didn't cross the road. <laughs> <laughs> It was the U-turn that they were forced to do on dropping animal welfare codes, specifically on chicken farmed for meat. Oh. Now, instead of facing an agonising and brutal death, chickens can look forward to a brutal death. <laughs> <laughs> the government was forced into a U-turn on academies. The great thing about academies is that they can't be run at a profit, so they only attract people who really want to raise standards for students, or deny evolution, <laughs> or introduce Sharia law. <laughs> And so to round two, the strengthometer of news. Fingers on buzzers, teams. Here's the first one. <laughs> this is genius. The, these sheep were stolen, but they had a photograph of the sheep that was stolen, and the police put it out, and they pixelated the faces of the sheep. <laughs> privacy reasons under the human rights legislation, genuinely. It wasn't exactly sheep privacy. They said the identity of the lambs has been protected due to their age and vulnerability. <laughs> <laughs> and deliciousness. <laughs> the police later revealed that it was a joke. Meanwhile, what has the Greater Manchester Police been planning for? Is this the possible terror attack in a shopping centre? Yes, right? it is. Yeah. They've been carrying out a training exercise simulating an IS-style attack on the Trafford Shopping Centre in Manchester. Let's take a look. <laughs> it's all just staged, they're all just actors, obviously, but it was horrifyingly realistic. And some people got very annoyed. Do you think it was a bad idea? Uh, well, I, I spoke to all the Muslims before we came on tonight. <laughs> 50-50 <laughs> split. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, a lot of people, a lot of Muslims are annoyed that they used Allahu Akbar, which I'm quite surprised by, because if you are doing a training exercise about possible people from ISIS, it's quite likely that they might be shouting Allahu Akbar, so fair enough to the police, I think. But I think a lot of Muslims are sort of saying, well, look, Allahu Akbar is used for different things, and, you know, if you are in a shopping centre and you hear somebody shout out Allahu Akbar, it could be that they could be about to bomb you, or it could be that uh, they're about to pray, or there's a sale on it next. Mm. So, <laughs> um, so, you know, I don't think that's only fair. They just want to make sure there's a distinction. One person tweeted, maybe in future training, the suicide bomber could shout, I'm blowing myself up for a generic terrorist cause. <laughs> Postmodern terrorism, that's what we want. <laughs> this is the news that the Greater <laughs> Manchester Police have carried out a terrorist training exercise. If people think shouting Alu Akbar is going to cause pandemonium, try going to the Trafford Centre and shouting that it's the last orders at Weatherspoons. <laughs> Time now for the odd one out round. Ian and Julia, your 4R. Pot Black Snooker, the Biami Tribe, the Natural Environment Research Council's Polar Research Vessel, and the fossilised egg of an elephant bird. Well, we know about the, the polar vessel because people voted for it to be called Boaty McBoatface and Boring McBoringface in the government decided that was wrong. Um, <laughs> so they're going to call it the Sir David Attenborough, but that, that prompted a petition rather wonderfully for Sir David Attenborough to change his name by deed poll to Sir David <laughs> McDavidface. <laughs> uh, so it's about changing your name? It's there not called this. Pot Black anymore. Yeah. Every colour is equal, it's called now. <laughs> is there a link to David Attenborough here? Oh, ah, he yes, because David Attenborough was the controller of BBC uh, Two oh, when yeah, he commissioned yes. Pot Black back in 1969. Because so it was a programme made for colour TV, as it was. Did he discover all these apart from which one didn't he? He, he, he didn't, dis he didn't discover that one. He didn't discover that, but he was named after it or something. Is the right answer? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> They're all known thanks to the work of Sir David Attenborough, apart from the UK's new polar research vessel, which is going to be named after him. I don't know if you followed the whole Boaty McBoatface thing. I thought it could have gone a lot worse if you were asking <laughs> the British public to decide on something. <laughs> They're lucky it wasn't called Harold Shipman. <laughs> Hitherto unknown Biami <laughs> tribe of Papua New Guinea were discovered by David Attenborough while filming a documentary in 1971. What did David Attenborough do with the egg from the gigantic but extinct elephant bird? He had to put it together. Because, he did. Yes, yeah, put it all back together. Yeah. Uh, he reconstructed it from over 1,000 pieces. Here's what he started out with. God, and here's man. his first attempt. <laughs> And then he made this. <laughs> what could be a more appropriate 90th birthday gift for David Attenborough than to give his name to a polar research vessel as they both begin a long, cold journey to a place of endless night? <laughs> Happy birthday, Sir David. <laughs> Paul and Adel, here are yours. 420 billion slugs. 2,186 goats, two wolves, and one weasel. Is the weasel the only one that nearly drowned in a bottle of milk? <laughs> <laughs> is the weasel the one that was in the Hadron Collider? It is. Ah, yes. Oh. yes. He ate through a cable and it stopped working. Mm -hmm. So, these other things did something. <laughs> Stop that, something yeah, working. I can play this game. I can do that. <laughs> and that's an exclusive. <laughs> They've all inconvenienced people except oh, yes. one. Apart from the goats. It's actually the wolves. Oh, yes. They have all inconvenienced people apart from the wolves, mm. which are a positive boon for Belarus's Eurovision entry, Ivan. <gasps> uh, Ivan is going to perform, I think, tonight, naked, with two presumably quite baffled wolves. <laughs> Hopefully well-fed wolves at this point. <laughs> the, uh... Hopefully well-drugged wolves. Yes. Uh, what does Ivan say is key to wolves. performing naked with wolves? <laughs> is the show called Dangling with Wolves? <laughs> <laughs> is the wolf wearing something in the sort of nether regions? There seems to be yeah. something... What is like a thong? He's or... wearing these other blokes' underpants. Yeah. <laughs> He's naked and the wolf's wearing a thong. Yeah, that's what's going on there. Yeah. The Eurovision knows its audience. <laughs> <laughs> and 
it's a blue screen, so God knows what the image will be like on the night. <laughs> what he said to the Mail Online was, the most important thing is to remember to feed them sausages on time. <laughs> Uh, a new super breed of sex mad sleepless slugs has arrived from Spain. Oh, uh, ah. an alliterative threat. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know how they got over here? Really slowly. <laughs> <laughs> Just been tossed from garden to garden. <laughs> For some people, it's a summer holiday. <laughs> <laughs> According to the Daily Mail, it was in some salad. You know? Uh, and why might these slugs be dangerous to road users? Um, they, they, the car crushes the slug, the slug gets caught up in the rubber, the rubber and the slug interact together in the way that only synthetic material and a live animal can, and um, <laughs> it all goes wrong. Well, I'm going to give you a point for that, because actually they get run over in the road, yes. other slugs come out to eat them, and it creates a slug slick. <laughs> <laughs> Looking forward to that. <laughs> A weasel disrupted the Large Hadron Collider last week. The Large Hadron Collider has revealed a lot of previously unknown information to scientists. For example, we now know how to cook a weasel to perfection. <laughs> Belarus's Eurovision entry, Ivan, will perform with wolves. The tragedy is, he's said to his friends so often in the past that he's going to be performing with wolves at Eurovision that nobody believes him anymore. <laughs> Time now for the Missing Words Round, which this week features as its guest publication, Parking Today. <laughs> if, like me, you're a massive fan of parking conventions, there's a brilliant one every day on the M25. <laughs> <laughs> and we start with... Designer chickens what? Are made before designer eggs. <laughs> That's the old debate. Yeah, sorted that one out. Designer <laughs> chickens at risk from thieves. Thieves are targeting middle-class homes and stealing rare chickens. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Next up, Professor Donald Shoup's book, What Has Become a Classic. Book on parallel parking has become a classic. Professor Donald Shoup's book of how I never want to write a classic has become a classic. <laughs> I'm going to give you a point for the first one because the answer is the high cost of free parking oh. is a classic in the parking oh. industry. Oh. I don't know anything about Professor Donald Shipp, but I guarantee <laughs> his nickname at school was Cream of Tomato. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, tea made from panda dung. What? Taste of bamboo and shit. <laughs> <laughs> It's tea made from panda dung among world's weirdest drinks. Oh. This is no. the news that you can now get panda tea made from poo. Poo tea is the name of the panda. <laughs> <laughs> so, the final scores are Paul and Adel have eight points and Ian and Julia have six points. <laughs> and I leave you with the news that... Outside the Houses of Parliament, a Tory aide desperately tries to stop the press, seeing what happens to Ian Duncan Smith after dark. <laughs> <laughs> At a Buckingham Palace tea party, there's relief that the cameraman who captured the Queen's undiplomatic remarks about the Chinese didn't look behind him. And outside an abattoir in Birmingham, Larry can't believe his luck, as his friends have remembered his birthday. <laughs> Good night. Have I got news for you back next Friday at the usual time of nine o'clock. Another star-studded lineup on the sofa with Graham Norton tonight here on BBC One, and he'll be along with the guest list in just a moment. Meanwhile, over on BBC Two, brand new comedy with the team behind the series, Him and Her. Leslie Manville stars as Mum.